apply Hinduism from a perspective of the normative rules of language, context, and logic. We've gone down to the point of analyzing the actual literature. That's the only basis for correct information about it. And if it's contradictory all the time, it's maybe not that trustworthy. So Hinduism from a perspective of the normative rules of language, context, and logic. Let's look at the unrealistic code of morality. The Gita has a completely contradictory and unrealistic code of morality. When Arjuna found himself in the process of choosing between his duty as a warrior and the killing of his relatives, a severe violation of Vedic morality, the Krishna explained to him that he must give a new meaning to traditional morality. <clears throat> traditional ethical values should not be a hindrance to acting detached from the fruits of action. He argued, the wise men who reach true knowledge see with equal vision, the wise men, see with equal vision a Brahmin, a priest, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater, really. And as a result, one whose mind is free from egotism, whose intellect is pure, is not bound even though he slays many people, for he does not truly slay. So, yeah, welcome serial killers. As only the, the self, Atman, is immortal, Krishna argues that it is actually impossible to kill anyone. Those who think that they can kill or those that think they can be killed or are confused in the manifestations of ignorance, contrary to funeral processions. The infinite immortal soul can neither kill nor be killed. On what basis? The asking questions, it's annoying, but then you get to the truth of the matter and don't waste a lot of time. Therefore, Arjuna is free to kill his relatives, considering them only temporary abiding forms for, for the eternal self, mere mortal frames. So S. Dasgupta states in his commentary, the theory of the Gita that if actions are performed with an unattached mind, so just get an M16, detach your mind and pull the trigger. Then their defects cannot touch the performer. Distinctly implies that the goodness or badness of an action does not depend upon the eternal effects of the action. Sounds like sociopathic attitudes. But upon the inner motivation of action. So in my inner motive, I'm doing good. Outer motive, I'm just locking and loading. If there is no motive of pleasure or self-gain, then the action performed cannot bind the performer, for it is only the bond of desires and self-love that really makes an action one's own and makes one reap its good or bad fruits. Morality, from this point of view, becomes wholly subjective. And the special feature of the Gita is that it tends to make all actions non-moral by cutting away the bones that connect an action with its performer. The contrast with traditional morality is obvious. <clears throat> Another important character in the battle of correct Kurukshetra, Yudhishthira, I'm going to break my jaw here, Arjuna's brother, tried to expiate his son of killing his relatives in battle through repentance, gifts, asceticism, pilgrimages, and so on. So you go kill a bunch of people and do all these other religious things, and it's all okay. For him, a bad conscience could not be cleansed by a right attitude of mind, but by compensatory acts. On the other hand, the same mindset that Arjuna should have had in securing a clear conscience, Gita 2.19, was used by the demon Kamsa and the Bhagavata Purana in order to comfort Krishna's parents and justify the killing of their other sons by him. In the bodily conception of life, one remains in darkness without self-realization, thinking, I am being killed, or I have killed my enemies. As long as a foolish person thus considers the self to be the killer or the killed, he continues to be responsible for material obligations, and consequently he suffers the reactions of happiness and distress. Heaven forbid you should feel anything about uh, when you've committed murder. In the same detached perspective on moral values can be used both on, by the demons Kama, Kamsa, who caused the corruption of the Dharma, and by Krishna as the divine avatar who came to restore it and kill the demon, it is hard to accept that such an approach could represent a true basis for morality, obviously. A morality that operates on the premise that any act is good as long as it is dedicated to God, 
understanding that it is truly God who is the controller of all, and thus rejecting a well-established set of moral commands, cannot have a good outcome in any religion, especially considering that mankind has never demonstrated any consistency in following his conscience or any religious rules, religion's rules of conduct. In fact, although this has no connection to, at all to Hinduism, those involved in the September 11 tax, 11 tax had such an attitude. Therefore, it's always dangerous to transcend moral values, thinking that a person who truly thinks of God won't commit evil deeds. Because that's kind of subjective. I'm doing this for God, or I'm, I'm I a God. But you haven't proved that as a fact, and then your behavior, whatever, it could be one thing or another, one extreme to the other. It just depends on your personal point of view. That's complete chaos. <clears throat> the Vedas, Vedas is neither infallible nor trustworthy. So the schools of ancient Indian thought are generally classified by orthodox Hindu thinkers into two broad categories, namely orthodox, astika, and heterodox, nastika. The six main Hindu systems of thought, which we may, you can pronounce here, are regarded as orthodox, astika, not because they believe in the existence of God, but because they accept the authority of the Vedas. Really, that's a little subjective. Out of the six orthodox systems of Hindu thought, Naya's system is primarily concerned with the conditions of correct thinking and the means of acquiring true knowledge. Who's to determine what true knowledge is? According to Naya's system, there are four distinct and separate sources of knowledge, namely perception, inference, comparison, and testimony, or Shabda, Shabda which is defined in the Naya system, Niya system, as valid verbal testimony, is further classified into the scriptural and the secular. So, Vaisdika, scriptural, or scriptural testimony, is believed to be the word of God, and therefore it is regarded as perfect and infallible. But how do you know it's perfect and infallible? It's valid because somebody designates it that way, but who's to, to say that they're valid? If the, but if the origin, origin of these writings is not from God, how would you know? Because one maintains that God does not exist, then they must may be from man who is flawed, and therefore the writings cannot be declared infallible or trustworthy. <clears throat> it's like a disease. Can it cure itself? No. Memanasa or Purva Mim Amasa. Another orthodox Hindu system is the outcome of the ritualistic side of the Vedic culture. However, in its attempt to justify the authority of the Vedas, Mimamsa, Mamamsa, elaborately discusses different sources of valid knowledge. Naturally enough, among the various sources of valid knowledge, Mamamsa pays greatest attention to testimony or authority, which too is regarded by it as a valid source of knowledge. There are, according to Mamamsa, two kinds of authority, personal and impersonal. The authority of the Vedas is regarded by Mamamsa as impersonal. As mentioned earlier, according to Nayaya, the authority of the Vedas is derived from their being the words of God. But Mimamasa, which does not believe in the existence of God, declares that the Vedas, like the world, are eternal. On one hand, one group says God exists, the other doesn't. And that's the whole religion? They are not the, these, they are not the work of any person, human or divine. So... How do you know it's eternal? The infallibility of the authority of the Vedas, according to Mimamasa, rests on the fact that they are not vitiated by any defect to which the work of imperfect persons is liable. This a personal point of view. Who says this? There is no proof offered as to the source which originate, originated this writing other than man himself. Thus, orthodox Hindu schools like Nihaya and Mimamasa regard the testimony of the Vedas as infallible. That's what they say, though they give different reasons for doing so. Well-known Orthodox he Hindu theologians like Shankar and Ramunja believed in the authority of the Vedas. And another guy, too, upholds the infallibility of the Vedas. Okay, who are you? As pointed out by S. N. Das Gupta, the validity and authority of the Vedas were acknowledged by all Hindu writers, and they had wordy battles over it with the Buddhists who denied it. So, only on the authority of a few flawed men can one testify that the writings are infallible, a contradiction in, light, in, in, uh, in logic.
Okay, more on this next time as we're running out of time.